is Linda Driver, and I'm a master food preserver in San Joaquin County. And today we're going to talk about gifts from the kitchen. And when we usually do gifts from the kitchen, we are usually having a great big workshop for 40 people at our Ag Center, and everybody's making stuff that they're going to take home, and it is a very long day. Today we're going to cover what we're going to do in before it will be done before noon. And my co-hosts for today are Colleen Young and Barbara Matais, and they are both master food preservers with San Joaquin County. And we each have different pieces of this presentation that we're going to do. Um, while one of us is speaking, the other two are going to be monitoring the chat. So if you have questions, put them in the chat and um, make sure that um, you, you ask questions because that's what we want to do. We want to answer questions and make sure that everybody is preserving food safely because that is our mission. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. Um, today we're going to, the things we're going to talk about, we'll be talking about food safety throughout all of our presentations and um, we'll do different pieces as we go along. We're going to talk to you about water bath and steam canning and we're going to um, talk about making cranberry jelly. And then we're gonna talk about our ever popular lemon curd and corn relish and some pickled Brussels sprouts that frog balls, is that, that's what they're called, right, Barbara? Frog balls. Anyway, and our criteria for the gifts from the kitchen is that it has to be pretty. It has to be pretty in the jar because then when you give it away, Everybody looks at it and says, oh, isn't that wonderful? So um, I'm looking at this here. I think we're doing okay. All right. So I'm going to start first and I'm gonna talk about cranberry jelly. And so Barbara and Colleen are going to handle the chat room while I do this. And I'm gonna go find my cranberry jelly PowerPoint. And hopefully, okay, view. No, that's not what I want. Okay, that's not, oh, I don't know what's going on here. I did not close up other windows and that is part of the problem here. I need to go find, I'm a, I'm a bad presenter. I didn't do what I told my cohorts to do. <laughs> that's, that's true. I'm, I'm a bad girl. Okay. All right. Slideshow. Yay. Woohoo. Okay. That is what the cranberry jelly looks like when it is done, especially if you put a light behind it. it without a light behind it, this is what it looks like in the jar. So it's kind of dark, but it's a dark, beautiful red. And it turned out really good. So. Linda, we're not seeing the slideshow. You're not seeing the slideshow. Oh, that's no. nice. you're screen sharing. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's stop share and new share. Okay. And I don't know why I'm not in the main thing here. Spotlight you. Spotlight. Thank you. I'm appreciative. Okay. <laughs> I am really I, knew, I found this out from not being able to know how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. And if there's anything else that you see as we go along, feel free because we are all on the we're all on the learning curve here. Okay. I want this one because that's the PowerPoint one. Okay. There we go. Yay! Woohoo! Okay. All right. So Cranberry jelly, I chose it because it is the easiest thing in the world to make. It only has four ingredients. And one of those is really small, a little bit of butter to keep you from fo foaming. And it can be done, I timed it. And from start to finish, it took me 40 minutes. So to finish processing, to, to make the jelly, put it in the jars and process it, took me 40 minutes. So I'm thinking that if you wanted to whip out one of these, you could do it in a, less than an hour and be happy with your result. And you get seven uh, 
one ounce, um, one cup jars out of a batch. So it's a nice thing. Now we talk about tools and this is part of our um, talking about water bath and steam canning. There are various tools and you don't need to have all of them, but they do make life easier if you have them. It helps if you have a jar lifter and that's what this thing is. And the way it works is you can pick up the jar and you can move it without tipping it over, which is a good thing to do. So it can go in and out of your canner kettle without burning your fingers. And that is always an appreciated thing, especially if you do this a lot. You will, it helps to have a timer of some sort. You can have a timer that is, this one happens to be very convenient because it's exactly a one minute timer. And so since one minute is how long you need to have your uh, jelly out of rolling boil, this thing comes in very handy. You can also use your phone or any other timer you want to. And let's see, this is a headspace measure and each of these little bumps as you go down is a quarter inch and it will help you find how high, how high the uh, jelly needs to be in the jar. But you can also do it with a chopstick and mark off some quarter inch marks on a chopstick and, and hold that over or get a very good eyeball for where the, if you look at a jar, the threads that the um, band screws on with are pretty good. If you look over here, that's about a quarter inch. And an inch is down below this main rim. And so you get an eye for it if you do it enough. Okay, let's see. Then a water bath canner. Everybody, I think most people are familiar with the shape of something like this. And it usually comes, if you have a canner that is a dedicated canner, it comes with a rack that you set the jars in and you can lift them up and down in the, in the pan. It also keeps the um, jars off the bottom of the pan. If you don't have one of those, and if you are new to canning and you want to try it out, but you don't want to go spend the money for a canner kettle or a steam canner, you can make anything that's deep enough a water bath canner. You can take some rings and you can tie them together with um, um, wire ties that you get off your bread loaves and you can make yourself a platform that you put in the bottom of the pan and you can set the jars on top like this and they will fit in your, your canner kettle. What is needed is you need space underneath the jar so that the water can circulate under the jar and you need to have space so that the water can circulate around the jars and then you need at least one inch of water over the top of your jars and room for it to boil. If, you, if, you, if it goes all the way up to the top of the uh, pot that you have, you're gonna have a mess on your stove. So you wanna have some extra space at the, um, at the top of your pot. And I can't, Colleen, can, do you see the admit? I took care of it. Thank you. Okay, so I have, if you have a deep soup pot, you can turn it into a water bath canner. I also have um, a spaghetti pot that has a built-in strainer that fits inside. And that works as a water bath canner because it's tall and deep. And so I can put jars in there and, and make it a water bath canner. So you don't have to go out and buy one. Um, if you're into it and you do a lot of canning, which those of us who are hosting this thing today, we do. Um, I was not too sure about this when I first got it or when I first heard about it, but I am a fan of a steam canner. And the reason I'm a fan of a steam canner is you only have to put this much water in it. So it only has about an inch or so of water in the bottom. And so it's not heavy like a water bath canner is. And you process things for the same amount of time in this as you do in that. And there are a couple of things in the use of it that are different, but that's, that's the main thing that's uh, different. 
and you don't have to use as much water and it weighs a whole lot less. So I'm a big, big fan of the steam canner and it's good for anything that takes less than 45 minutes to process. So I've never heard of a jelly that took more than 10 minutes to process. So I think you're good on that. So you need um, stirring spoons and you need a measuring cup. And those are about the things that you really have to have. Okay. Why are we not? Okay. You want to do it that way? That's fine. Okay. To start with, and we'll be talking about sterilizing things as we go through things, but um, this particular recipe only processes the jelly for five minutes. And that means we have to sterilize the jars because it takes 10 minutes to sterilize something. If your processing time is 10 minutes or longer, then you can get away without having to do this step. But if it's five minutes, you definitely need to do it. And so in order to do it, you either are going to fill the water bath canner with water and put your jars inside to process them, or you're going to do it in your steam canner. And in both of those cases, the processing means like if it's in the water bath canner, you bring it to a boil and you boil it for 10 minutes. In the steam canner, what tells you that you're, you're doing what you're supposed to be doing is the steam canner has a little hole in the back and you will see a column of steam coming up from that. You want that to be in the back because you don't want to burn your face when you're looking at it. And then the steam can the one I have has this dial on the top that gives you a green zone that tells you when you can start counting your time for processing. And so you would bring this up to, up to temperature, you'd get it in the green zone and go 10 minutes. And then your, your jars will be sterilized and ready to go. And you can leave them sit there in that canner with the hot water in them while you're making the jelly. Okay, to make the jelly, this is easy. You put the juice, that juice that I bought in a jar and the, the juice that I bought in the jar was 100% cranberry juice, not from concentrate. So it didn't have any other additives in it. It was just cranberry juice. So Cranberry juice, one package of pectin, and a little dab of butter. And the purpose of the butter is what it does is it puts a, that little fine oil sheen on the top, keeps it from having bubbles and, and having foam, which there's nothing wrong with the foam. You can eat the foam. I eat the foam all the time, but it doesn't look pretty in your jar. And so that's why we don't want it. Let's see. Okay. One of the things that I have found that people who don't can don't, it's not common for their, their vocabulary, is what is a full rolling boil? And the definition is one that you cannot stir down. You have it on high heat, it is going, it's psychedelic in watching it, um, but you are stirring the whole time, but you never can stir it down. That's what constitutes a full rolling boil. So to make this jelly, you put those ingredients in the pot, you bring it up to a full rolling boil. And then once it has reached the full rolling boil, then you add in the sugar and all at one time and it starts to continue to stir. And then you return it to a full rolling boil. And then that's, as soon as you re reach that point where it looks like that, then you turn your timer over and count, count down your time. When you've gotten to the end of the time, turn off the heat, let it settle down, skim off any foam. And when I made this, um, I'm thinking that because the juice had nothing else, else in it, I had, I didn't have any foam. And that's, that's sort of very unusual because usually there's some foam, but there wasn't any real, there was no real foam on this jelly. So all of it went into jars. And once you've done that, you go and you fill your jars. And you can fill your jars with a funnel, which a lot of people do, but I don't. My way of filling the jars is I use a one cup measure and I fill it up and I pour it carefully into the canning jar. And if you're careful, you don't have any messes. And I must be careful because I don't have messes too often. Once you get done, 
if you did dribble any on the edge, you take a wet paper towel and you clean off the top edge of the jar and anything that's on the side of the jar, because anything that's on that top rim can interfere with your seal and you don't want to do that. You want a seal that makes a good seal and stays sealed. And if there's any food or anything on that, um, that rubber ring on the inside, you can lose that seal and then your jelly can go bad. You don't want that. So once you put, fill your jars and wipe the edges, then you put on the lids and you put on the two piece lids and you put the, um, piece that goes on the jar first and then you put the band on and we ask you to tighten it to finger tight now that doesn't mean six foot six big strong man finger tight I always describe it as it means grandma Linda finger tight so you don't you're not trying to put a wrench on it you just need to tighten it up so that it'll stay put while you're processing then you put it either in the water bath canner or in the steam canner and you put the lid on and you bring it up to a boil or to whether you see that column steam coming out of the back. And, and, and if you have the dial on the top, you see the, that you've got in, into the green zone for your, um, your altitude. And if you're at sea level, you're going to the darkest green on that um, dial and then you have to read it carefully if you're at altitude because you have if you're at altitude you need to process it for it takes longer so you process it for the five minutes and then you're one of the other things where these two methods are different is what you do when you've reached the end of your processing time if you're in a water bath canner you turn off the heat and take the lid off and let it sit for five minutes you want all the contents inside the jar and everything to settle down. If it's a steam canner, and I double checked with my, my user guide that came with my steam canner. If it's a steam canner, you turn the heat off and let it sit for five minutes with the lid on. And then you take, take the lid off. Once that five minute time has passed, then you lift the jars out of whichever canner it's in and you put them on the side on a towel or a trivet or, or a wooden uh, cutting board or something to cool. And you leave them untouched for 24 hours. And at the end of the 24 hour time period, that seal has had a good chance to make sure it's made a real bond with the jar and you will be good to go. And then you want to make sure you label things because you know when you made it now but six, six months from now, you might not be so sure. And so you really want to know what's in that jar and when did you do it? And we recommend, and it's mostly for quality. I think that things are safe, but the quality goes downhill. Uh, one of the jellies I make is an elderberry jelly. And at one time for a class, I happened to have um, three jars that were different ages. One was, I think, about three years three or four years old, one was a little over a year old and one was brand new. And when I opened the jars and took the jelly out, you could see a quality difference. The one that was absolutely fresh was bright in color and held its gel and looked, looked like a jewel. The one that was about a year old was still looked really pretty good, but not as good as the one that was absolutely fresh. And the one that was older, had sort of tart was going towards the brown side and I'm sure it was still nutritious and stuff but it just didn't look as appetizing or as pretty so you want to rotate your stock you don't want to make if you're going to give it away that's a great thing and you want to make sure that you use up stuff within about a year because it'll be better and then you enjoy and that was um I took the picture yesterday and I added on my toast this morning. And this jelly is a good jelly to give as a gift because it's pretty and it's a nice tart jelly. It's not too sweet. And I think that will, um, it tasted, it seemed tart to me when I only tasted it on a spoon, but on the toast with the butter and peanut butter, it was very good this morning. So that is the cranberry jelly. So 
Did anybody have any questions we need to answer? Colleen, Barbara? No, I've been answering. Okay, did we have anything? Chatting. Did we have anything that I need to answer? Nope. Okay. Oh, uh, Linda Hoover wants to know how much sugar. Uh, I think it was four and a half cups. Let me, I don't know if I can, let, let me go. That re, the amount was right on the front. And these, um, this yeah, recipe came from the SureGel site. And they're one of the approved places that we can use recipes from. And uh, they have other jellies that you can make from straight juice that you can buy at the store. And I'm going to tell you, that's about the fastest jelly you're ever going to make in the world is pour, pour the juice out of, out of a bottle and measure it and put it in a pan and make gel, jelly. So it was four and a half cups of sugar, four cups of cranberry juice. Anybody else? Okay. All right, then I am going to stop share, I think, if I can figure out how. No, I can't seem to figure out. How do I stop share? I don't seem to have, oh, there's my cursor. Okay, there we go. There okay. Go. Hey, woo -hoo. <laughs> I feel successful whenever we do that. Okay, Barbara was going to do lemon curd next. So I'm gonna turn it over to Barbara. Okay, this is gonna be interesting because I'm still- um, No, you're a co-host. You are a co-host. I am a co-host? You're okay. a co-host now. So all right. Well, <laughs> erase, erase. Um, I don't know how to spotlight myself. So how do I do that? Um, I let's see. Spotlight. Um, do 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 do. Barbara, more. Spot. Add spotlight. There you go. That's you. Okay. I can so, unspotlight me. I think. Okay. No. Apparently, I'm not able to unspot my me. <laughs> okay. Okay, so there I am anyway. Okay. Um, okay, and I want to go to my PowerPoint. You want to go to screen, sh share screen. I Oh, I think I did that. Did I not? I don't know. Um, All right, what do you see in front of you? I, I see myself. No, go to sh share screen. Okay, hang on just a moment then. Okay, now I see a whole bunch of things. So find, your, um, find the PowerPoint you want. Okay, got it. And make sure there. you click on sound. Um, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, well, okay. I don't. All right, I need to go to a slideshow. Yes. Uh, from the beginning. Yes. There, there you go. go. Now, do you see? Do you see it? We see it. <laughs> I always have to check. Yay! Because, <laughs> like, that's exactly right. Um. Okay. Uh, lemon curd. Uh, pronounced curd, not crud, as some <laughs> have suggested. So, um, just uh, FYI. I can see um, all of us on the side screen. So if other people can see you, be aware that other people can see you. So uh, there you go. Um, okay, advanced. Here we go. Um, this is a, a standard um, a presentation that can stand alone. So it has uh, uh, things in it that Linda has already talked about, but we uh, like to have each of these things in every um, presentation so that um, we're not skipping anything. So this is produce safety. And this applies to lemon curd in that you're gonna wash the lemons. Um, this is about uh, produce and how to, to uh, scrub surfaces and uh, things don't come clean uh, from the store or off your tree uh, because there are critters out there and there are critters in the store. Okay. So uh, these are just standard, um, scrub it with uh, running water, don't soak it, um, and dry it off when you get finished. It, uh, I also want to talk about uh, contamination from your own kitchen. 
Um, I heard a, a doctor on the radio this morning that talked about uh, contamination, and we kind of do it to ourselves. Uh, so make sure that your kitchen surfaces, cutting boards, knives, um, uh, utensils are clean, um, either with 10% um, bleach solution, which is one part uh, bleach and nine parts water, or um, other disinfecting um, liquids that you um, are aware how to use because they are different in how you use them. Uh, bleach is recommended because it kills more germs. And so that's why we go that way. Um, th and this is again, sanitation, uh, wash your hands, uh, don't pet your cat and then start canning. So you need to wash your hands and everything else. And um, running water is, the, is also the key. You don't like soaking things. So that's kind of standard to presentations, and we just like to remind you because um, we don't want anybody to, uh, to be sick over the things that they make. Okay, um, this is the recipe. This is only the ingredients. Um, these ingredients, you do, will have access to the recipes, and um, I will go through this, and I'm going to tell you some um, variations uh, on some of these things, but... Um, uh, this one's an easy recipe too. Uh, there are a couple of critical areas and I will, when I get there, I'll tell you about them, but um, we'll go on. We're going to gather all the ingredients and all the jars because you don't want to be in the middle of anything when you find out that you don't have enough of something. So I always uh, measure out uh, everything first and I always do um, more cups than I need, more jars than I need. Uh, the yield on this recipe says three cups, so I prepare, prepare four cups worth of volume in some formation of jars because you can put them, uh, like most recipes, you can put them in smaller jars and uh, make more servings out of them, more gifts to give from the kitchen. Uh, so sometimes I put them in uh, four ounce um, jars because they're little and sometimes people don't want to be overwhelmed with something and I uh, sterilize them. I use the water out of the uh, jars that I've sterilized and I pour it in a, um, a bowl with the lids and the rings in it. So although I don't boil them, they sit there in the hot water for a long time. Uh, freezer products are not processed any kind of uh, hot water bath or steam canner. So that's why you have to sterilize the jars beforehand. Okay, lemon curd, you can find lots of recipes and uh, lots of them process those recipes to make them shelf stable. I don't like those recipes because they, they make a different texture and they make a different color. And the, uh, to hold this nice bright yellow color, freezer is the best way to go. You can store it in a freezer for up to a year. Mine never lasts that long. It can be stored in the refrigerator for four weeks or eat it now. It's one of the things that we can make that we can eat now. Lots of things need time to season. So pickled things, you know, two weeks, three weeks, they taste better. Uh, lots of, I've made uh, freezer jams out of kiwi. And when you first uh, make it, all you taste is sugar. But if you let it be stored for a while, you get the kiwi flavor. When you thaw it out, it's marvelous if you ever, get a chance to get near a kiwi plant. Okay, uh, here's, here's my canner with the jars, just like Linda's picture, except I've got a different size jars because that's me. And uh, I put them in the steam canner and I let it come up to temperature and I uh, process them for 10 minutes and followed all the rules. Okay, so here's my four teaspoons of grated lemon peel from one lemon. Yeah, don't believe it unless it's an extra large lemon because it's <laughs> three, about three and three fourths teaspoon from this lemon. And that's what I used. And um, it wasn't gonna spoil anything. I do believe in following the recipe, um, but a fourth of a teaspoon just wasn't gonna hurt me too much. And um, I will buy a bigger lemon next time because, you know, but you can see I kind of scalped that lemon. Okay, uh, this is the lemon juice. Um, I'm not recommending any label and I can't read that anyway. 
uh, two thirds of a cup of a bottle of lemon juice or fresh. If you have a lemon tree, freeze the juice, make curd later. And then the special rule, if you use Meyer lemons, you need to add one tablespoon to the one cup of um, sugar that's in the recipe. Now, the reason you can use lemons off your tree is because it is not depending on the acidity in the lemon to make this recipe. It's strictly going for flavor. So although most recipes that use lemon juice to add acid to the recipes and you need to use bottled lemon juice, this one you can use either one, doesn't matter. So I like that. Okay, five eggs uh, size does make a difference. This is the only thing that's going to add volume to your um, lemon curd. Uh, the recipe doesn't say to use different size. I use medium. Next time I'll use large or extra large, and I'll probably come out with the three cups that the recipe says, um, because I only came out with two and a half cups. Mm. So, um, and I make sure they're all good before I count them. Okay, this is a super duper blender that belongs to my son-in-law because I cook in their kitchen. And um, you just chuck them all in the blender and everything except the butter, okay? So turn that thing on, man, and it just mixes like you wouldn't believe. Okay, so melted butter. And butter is better, makes it taste better. Uh, while the blender is running, you add the melted butter, and I melted mine, and then I let it sit just a while. It was still liquid, but it didn't quite have the heat in it. You add it slowly because if you add it all at once, you will cook part of the egg that's in the blender, and then you will have scrambled eggs in your lemon curd. So you want to add it slowly uh, so that the heat doesn't hit the, the uh, eggs all at once, and, um, and it works really well, and I uh, just you know, I melted it in a um, microwave. So you put all this stuff after it's in the blender, you put it all in a pot. And let me tell you, you stir constantly. If you don't, you'll get lumps. And uh, right there, you can see the red top. My background isn't wonderful, but you can see the red top uh, thermometer. I cooked it until it got up to 170 degrees and I turned it off. So you remove it from heat, stir it a couple times, um, and then you ladle it into jars. Okay, on the right, you can see the green funnel because I'm not like Linda, I'm messy. <laughs> so I use funnels for everything. And uh, it needs a quarter inch headspace. But you can see how, how full the two jars are. And I put, uh, wipe the, the rims and put the lids on uh, out of the hot water and the rings on finger tight. Actually, a little more than finger tight because you're not processing these. You're putting the whole thing with its lid, with the ring in the freezer. But first you're gonna let them cool a little bit because you don't wanna shock the, uh, the glass going from sort of warm. So uh, into the refrigerator they went and on a, a, a protected towel because I didn't want to break any of the shelves on the refrigerator either. And the, and the neat thing about it is you, the one that's open, um, how to serve it will be on the recipe. But um, as Colleen says, you serve it on a spoon. So <laughs> it is yummy. It is, it is excellent. Uh, here are some resources that we uh, give out um, and you'll get uh, all of these too. But um, this recipe, um, where did the recipe come from? I can't remember. I think it came from, I think it came from the uh, National um, Center for Home Food Preservation. I use this site all the time. Uh, it has a wonderful search engine that you cannot find, but trust me, it's on the left-hand side among a list of other opportunities to click on. But you click on the search and you put in there whatever words you want and it will absolutely take you to that recipe. It may take you to the University of Alaska or Washington or Oregon, um, but it'll find a recipe for you if they don't have it in there. Also, uh, USDA has wonderful uh, recipes and it will take you to that site too. So it's a great one to have um, at your disposal. National Center for Home Food Preservation. It's a third one down the list. 
and uh, it's at University of Georgia. So if you forget it, just Google University of Georgia um, uh, food, uh, food preserving. It'll get you there. It's good. Okay, and that's all. Are there any questions? I didn't see any on the chat that we didn't answer, but uh, Barbara, you want to talk about some of the other ways that you can use lemon curd other than straight out of the jar? <laughs> well, the one that I use is I make this for a tea party that um, that we have in January, and hopefully we will be able to do it this year. But uh, scones is my favorite way. Um, the second way that I use it is um, I use it between the layers of a cake, so skinny layer layer of uh, lemon curd, another layer of cake. Um, I know there's more ways uh, listed at the end of the recipe and I don't have the recipe in front of me and can't remember what they are. But I know that those are the ways that I use it. Um, I've also put it on top of um, uh, various things like a dressing, you know, um, uh, muffins. I don't use it like a frosting because it will kind of uh, water and slide off. But if you're eating anything like um, like a cinnamon roll, um, really yummy. Um, do you have any, Linda or Colleen? One of, one of my favorite ones that I use is um, if I have lemon curd in the freezer, if I suddenly find that I'm supposed to be bringing something to a potluck and I don't have a whole lot of time, I can go to the grocery store and buy a um, graham cracker crust, pie crust that's already made and get a container, um, you know, a, not the small container, the medium-sized container of Cool Whip or, or one of those whipped toppings. And I can thaw the lemon curd, whip, fold it into the whipped topping, put it in the pie shell, and I have got a lemon chiffon pie that is really good. And it took almost no time. So those are, those are the ways, that's one of the ways I have used it more than once. Also, I put it in my uh, yogurt, my plain yogurt. Mm. That sounds good. I'm going to try that. Yeah. Okay. I think you can stop sharing screen now, Barb. There you I go. Did. Okay. <laughs> All right. I didn't see any more questions in the chat for that. So we're moving, rolling right along. And Linda, Linda I had a question on your pie. Yeah. How, how many jars of lemon curd? would you use? I have used um, three or four. Okay. Gives it a really nice, rich, lemony. Lemony flavor. Flavor, but the, the Cool Whip kind of stuff fluffs it up so that it's light and airy. And then I, if if time permitting, is do it, put it back in the refrigerator so that it can kind of firm up a little bit. A little yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's really good. Okay. Up next, is one of my favorite things. I keep it this around all year and I use it on all kinds of things. I use it with, I use it on my tacos. I put it with my scrambled eggs and everything else. One of my favorite things. And Colleen is gonna take us through corn relish. Corn relish, yes, yes. Um, let me pull up my... presentation here. Okay. Let's go there. There we go. All right. Um, corn relish. It is, looks really nice in the jar. And uh, I made two sizes this year, and I'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. Um, but like Linda said, this is good in a lot of ways um, with eggs or with a taco, or I have it with, uh, with chicken. It has a nice um, pickling flavor. It, it's uh, very, very tasty. Uh, what you need to do is when you get your vegetables, and here's a picture of everything that goes into it, you want to make sure, like Barbara said, you want to make sure that you wash all of your vegetables. I just rinse them under uh, running water, put them in the dish drainer, and then dry them off before I use them. Um, this does take a few ingredients, um, and I have found that if you, it takes actually just a couple of 
uh, ribs of celery, about a large pepper, red and green, and about a medium um, onion. This is a recipe that you can make any time of the year. You can use fresh corn. You can use, you can get corn on the cob and it takes about 18 uh, cobs of corn or you can use frozen corn and they all work just fine. And here are the ingredients. It says two, two quarts cooked corn, um, about 18 ears if you're using fresh corn or about, about three pounds if you're using frozen. And that'll give you more corn than you need, but you wanna make sure that you have enough ingredients. Uh, so I always kind of over overdo. Um, one of the options you have with this recipe is to use pickle crisp. Uh, I did some jars with pickle crisp and I did some jars without. Uh, there was a little bit of difference. I think that the pickle crisp jars were a little, are a little crisper. Okay, make sure when you chop your vegetables that they are chopped to the same size as, as the corn kernels. It makes for a uniform look in the jar and it also makes sure that everything cooks evenly. So it takes taking a uh, doing the chopping takes a little time. I lucked out and the onion that I bought was a sweet onion. And so I didn't even have any issues with, with tears. It worked out really well for me. And I had um, got everything. This isn't all of the corn in my picture, but I wanted to show you the size of everything chopped in comparison to the corn. So you want to get that even, even chop for everything, okay? And here is a picture of my jars heating up. We don't need to sterilize our jars for this recipe, but we do need them to be hot. If you are canning something that is going to process for 10 minutes or longer, you do not need to sterilize. Now, uh, Barbara had to sterilize her jars because it was going in the freezer. Linda had to sterilize her jars because they only, it, the jam, or excuse me, jelly, only processed for five minutes. So with those situations, you wanna make sure that what you're putting your food into is sterilized. That's very important. And you wanna prepare your rings and your lids according to manufacturer's directions. Whoopsie, I need to go back one. Uh, and go around again. There we go. Too fast on the trigger. Okay, if you're using pickle crisp, you wanna make sure that you put it directly into the pint jars. This recipe calls for pint jars. Um, which is an eighth of a teaspoon. If you're using half pints, which I did some pints and some half pints, it's a 16th of a teaspoon, which really isn't, it's kind of hard to measure. And I decided to not put it in the half pints just to see if it made a difference. Now this recipe is made for pint jars which is the bigger ones, but because I will give some away, I like to give away the half pint jars. The processing is the same, the same amount of time. But what you don't want to do is put it in a quart jar <laughs> because the processing would be longer. So, and it, I like to follow the recipe. So I would not use a quart jar, but because I am processing the same amount of time, I feel I don't feel bad about using the half pint and it gives, gives me more jars to give out. So once you have put your pickle crisp in your jars, if you're using it, then you combine all the rest of the ingredients in a large saucepan and you bring to a boil. 
Now, unlike uh, Linda's rolling boil, that's not necessary in this jar, in this uh, recipe. You just bring it to a boil, you turn down your heat and you simmer it for about 20 minutes. You fill the prepared hot jars and this has a half inch head space. And you can see that I have used my space uh, stick. <laughs> And um, I always like to take a chopstick and stir to make sure that I don't have any air pockets in my, my uh, jars. I measure again, if my jar has a little too much or not enough uh, to bring it up to the half, half inch mark, then I'll take my uh, spoon and I just make sure that I get the correct amount of head space in there. That is important because it has to do with, with the vacuum seal. So if you don't have enough head space or if you have too much, you can, um, it affects the way the vacuum works and you can have um, some of your ingredients coming out of the jars, which can affect the way that your lid seals. You don't, you want your lids to be clean because that's the seal which keeps out the air and stuff. So I used my um, steam canner that Linda talked to you about. Um, process is the same if you're using a boiling water bath canner or if you make your own canner. Uh, when I'm doing something that is a small batch, I have uh, a, a saucepan that's, or a saucepan, a soup, a stock pan that is tall enough. It's tall and thin, and I put my rings on the bottom like Linda showed you, and I can use that to make a small batch of something and make sure it gets uh, sealed well, processed correctly. But since I've gotten my steam canner, that's what I use most of the time. And here's my steam canner. And on the right is a picture of the gauge. Uh, and you'll notice that they have the rings. There's the blue, the orange, and the yellow. And they have to do with your altitude. And you can't really see it here, uh, but the, the green section, which is where you are, want your dial to reach before you start timing for your process. That when you put your, your uh, when you turn your steam canner on, you have to wait until the dial reaches the green section for your altitude before you start timing your process. That's very important to wait until it's green. Green is go. <laughs> and after you, after, afterwards, the picture on the, the uh, left shows you that the, the jars are just sitting there. I, if I'm just doing one batch of something, I generally will just leave my jars sit on the, the steamer until the 12 or 24 hours. Then I check to make sure that they have sealed. Um, I wipe them off and I label them. Now you don't wanna to forget to label them because like Linda said, you will forget what's in that jar because it looks just like this other thing that maybe you labeled, maybe you didn't. Um, when I was young, my dad worked at the cannery and he would bring home uh, cans of food that didn't have a label. And so it was, was kind of a, gee, what are we having for dinner tonight kind of thing. And when you get a lot of peaches, you maybe don't want all those peaches for dinner. It's kind of the same thing with something that you've canned. Uh, if you don't know what it is, it's kind of a, a guessing game. So in this case, I just write on the top. When I'm giving these away, I, I will put a label on it so that it looks a little nicer. But until then, 
I know that this is corn relish. Now I can tell by looking at the jar that this is corn relish, but I may not know when I canned it. So I always put a date. A lot of times when I am giving a jar of something for a gift, I will put a use by date and I'll say on there, use by whatever date that I decided. I usually put a year in advance. So uh, whatever method you decide to use, whether to put the, the date for canning that you canned it or use by date, it helps people a lot as to when they need to use it. All right, Colleen? Yes. Um, had a question and I think it would be good to, I've told them that there are spices in the recipe, but can you tell uh, people what the spices were that were put into the corn relish? Uh, yes, there was uh, turmeric. Well, let me look at my screen here. because I know there's turmeric and mustard seeds and I'm not it, sure. Yeah, there's um, turmeric, mustard seed, celery, uh, seed? celery seed, dry mustard and salt. Right, okay. I almost could do it from memory. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> probably earlier if you had asked me, I would have been able to uh, say it, but uh, <laughs> when I put on the spot, then I got to check my information. Okay, and I uh, want to let everybody know that um, the uh, recipes will be uploaded probably tomorrow and um, in Marcy will be sending out um, a link for people and then the uh, the, vi the video of the presentation takes time to process and so that will probably be next week I'm thinking. Yeah. Um, I had a few few more things to discuss and one is the shelf life of the stuff that we can for home canning um, and, and you touched on that a little bit uh, Linda with the the difference in your jams, I believe it was that you made. Um, high acid foods, tomatoes and fruits uh, last about a year. And it's not the, the safety, it's the quality of what you've canned. After about a year, it, it turns, um, it's still nutritious and it still is edible, but it, it doesn't taste, it loses its uh, taste. It loses the, um, the texture of the food. So you, you don't want to hang on to that for too long. Uh, if you're making jams and you're using a low or no sugar recipe, those do not, they only last about six months because the sugar that you are not putting in there acts as a, preservative and if it, you're not using it it doesn't help to preserve what you're making. I know Linda you did a uh, strawberry jam mm -hmm. class where you did different things and the low sugar was was the favorite but it doesn't last as long. It also doesn't last as long once it's opened. That's right. So uh, th those are things you need to be uh, aware of. And with pickling, um, when you, if you taste it, I had a, about a quart, uh, the small um, four ounce jar left that didn't get processed. And so I put it in the refrigerator and ate it over a couple of days. And I will tell you that after a couple of weeks, the flavor is much better than what, what was eaten right away. Right. With pickling stuff, it gives a chance for everything to kind of meld. So that's something you might, might want to take into consideration. If you're going to be doing pickling stuff, you might want to do it a couple of weeks before you're planning on giving it out. And that's one of the reasons we're doing Gifts from the Kitchen in October. That's right. So that if you want to make any of these things to give away to people for Christmas presents, um, you'll have time for them to mellow and and to experiment and give away something really pretty and good. Right, and you wanna make sure that you store them correctly. They should be in a, uh, a cool 
dry space and it, it helps if the, it's a dark place as well. So if you have a basement or uh, maybe under your bed, I, I don't suggest a, an attic or your garage. It usually- Actually this work. time of year, you could put it in the garage. But, yes, this <laughs> time of year you could. But uh, <laughs> earlier on when it's so hot, that's not a good choice. So October to October to March, you can put it in your garage, but after that, <laughs> not so much. Yeah, especially if you're in the Central Valley of California. Yes. Okay. Well, I think that's pretty good, and I think we um, we answered um, the questions, and so I uh, great job. And Barbara, are you ready to talk about frog balls? I am. Okay. So you need to share screen and find your frog balls. <laughs> this I want to do. <laughs> uh, you should have put frog balls under that. <laughs> well, OK, so um, I say you better I tell people balls. why they're called frog balls. Yeah, well, I say to people, uh, I'm going to can Brussels sprouts. And they say to me, oh, frog balls. But I don't normally call them that because um, they, I mean, I have no idea what a frog ball looks like, but they do. <laughs> anyway, uh, that, that's, um, um, people know that name, but that's not my thing to call them in public. Um, okay, okay, so here we go. This recipe is called, um, you know, I don't know whether it's called pickled cauliflower and Brussels sprouts or, or pickled Brussels sprouts and cauliflower. And uh, I turned it around every time I did it, but it's made for both. And so we're going to talk about both and we're going to talk about why we're talking about both um, as we go through it. So here we go with the uh, produce safety again. And um, Brussels sprouts are a little hard to wash, but um, but you do need to rinse them off and you need to uh, take out the off the outer leaves of them. Uh, this also calls for uh, red pepper and um, and so that just wash your produce, okay? Wash your surfaces, um, sanitize them, don't pet the cat, and there you go. So uh, here are the ingredients, um, and I add this because um, because I don't have a paper copy anymore. Um, it says it makes about high, nine half pints, and so I want to tell you about the quantity. Um, I. The, when I was making this, it was not necessarily Brussels sprout um, season. And so um, I had to go to the grocery store and buy them. And uh, when you have to buy your product like that, you better want it because they're not cheap. And what I like to do is um, I don't grow Brussels sprouts anymore. I used to. Um, but you can get them more in bulk if you're if they're more seasonal. Uh, you can get them at the farmers markets and stuff like that. But um, th I went to the grocery store, so I bought what I could afford at the time, which was uh, not 12 cups of cauliflower. Now you can do that uh, with a recipe like this. Uh, don't like to change recipes, but you can do it like this because you're processing the cauliflower and the Brussels sprouts. And then you're adding all the stuff to it. <clears throat> so all the stuff to it, I made in a, in a regular batch. And I'll tell you more about that. But so all of the things underneath the, the Brussels sprouts, uh, the vinegar and sugar and onion and uh, red sweet pepper and all that stuff, I did just like the recipe. And you need to, we always say, follow the recipe. Well, and then we tell you when you don't have to. Okay, so where you don't have to on this recipe is, the amount of cauliflower or Brussels sprouts. As long as so, it's less than 12 cups, right? Well, yeah, you don't want to make more because then you don't have enough um, juice to cover it. So as a matter of fact, um, my experience is if I actually had 12 cups, I wouldn't have enough juice. I don't know why that is, but it never seems to work out for me. And I want to make sure that I have enough of the um, of the, it's not juice, but whatever you want to call it, the, brine. The, mixture that, the brine that's going to go over it. So it doesn't bother me to make less. And uh, and I'll tell you right now, it makes the most wonderful salad dressing ever. Um, I will never buy any more salad dressing. This uh, this combination of um, 
of the uh, ingredients uh, because I did have it left over because I didn't make 12 cups is just fantastic salad dressing. Okay, so the jars are warmed. Uh, the uh, rings and lids. Okay, the flat part is the lid, and of course the round part is the is the ring. And it, they're all washed, um, and jars are warmed, and they're ready to go, waiting on the countertop. These are my tools. I use a funnel. That uh, green thing on the left, <laughs> Colleen, is a debubbler <laughs> and taste major. Um, and then there's the jar lifter right in the middle. So the debubbler, which I don't think is a real word, but I'm not sure, um, <laughs> is, the, is the smooth, long part of the of the um, head space measure. So here's your old measuring thing. And then this part, which I do use on this recipe, uh, goes in to get the uh, air bubbles and the, out of the jars because you don't want that extra um, space in the jars. My so, problem with that, Barbara, is mm -hmm. that I don't want the handle to be sticky. Okay. <laughs> so that's why I use. That's another stick. Okay. Yes. Fine. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> okay. So from the store, the Brussels sprouts look like that. Sometimes they have a lot more loose leaves on them, which you want to peel off um, because you don't know what's under them mostly. And then on the right, I, I've um, trimmed off the hardened end on it so that they're nice and fresh green on it. And um, that's all I did to them, except I did rinse them all first. Okay, so then um, uh, I chopped, I washed, chopped up the onion. And this is where I, I go, you know, that extra thing and I measure everything first. So I've got all of my little ingredients all measured out and on a, um, on a plate or another uh, bowl so that I know that I have everything. I have made recipes where I have not done this. And then all things stop and I go to the store. So I, I don't like that. Um, this is canning salt. Uh, this is uh, canning and pickling salt. Um, there's all these questions about salt. This is what I use because I don't have to think about the portions of it or the weight of it. Um, in this case, it's not going in the jars. What it is is going in the gallon of water that we're going to blanch the cauliflower and Brussels sprouts in. So, um, but if you put regular salt in that water, then um, for one thing, I know that it turns colors in the jar. So I don't know how much of it is absorbed into the, the uh, sprouts or cauliflower, but I just use canning salt and I don't have to think about it. Um, I know other people use other kinds of things. I just, that's one thing I don't have to worry about. I just go on. Okay, so I've got the Brussels sprouts in the pot and I'm going to boil them. And um, big deal, there they are. Okay, so <laughs> now in the middle of this uh, little experiment that we're presenting today, uh, I was only going to do the Brussels sprouts, but then we decided that uh, it would look really pretty for our gifts from the kitchen uh, for the holiday season to add the white cauliflower. So um, in some proportion, and it really doesn't matter what, I'll show you the jars afterwards, you would put the uh, trimmed cauliflower Brussels sprouts in the salted water, and you have to boil the sprouts for four minutes and the Brussels sprouts for three. So I brought the Brussels sprouts uh, the other way around. The way around the Brussels sprouts for four. I put them in, <laughs> I brought them to a boil, I added the cauliflower, I timed for three, uh, and they all got cooked. Okay, so then you drain them. Okay, there's no cauliflower in here because I didn't go back and take that picture again. But um, you don't have it says it's a, in the recipe, it says to cool them. I didn't do anything to them, I put them in the strainer and I let them cool. It was, uh, you know, it's an air conditioned house it'll cool off by itself. And I didn't want to uh, add another layer of coolness by some means. So just let them sit in there while you do the pickling solution and, and it'll be fine. So here's all the stuff in a pot. And this is a big pot, but I don't like uh, splashing. And I do enough of it on my own that I want to prevent it when I can. <laughs> 
I put it in a big pot and that way you have more surface, um, they get heat and it comes to a boil faster and all that stuff. And then you simmer it for five minutes. And again, great salad dressing. Okay, so now after you, after you cook that uh, pickling solution, the brine, um, you take some of the onions and the pepper and you put them in the bottom of the jar. That's kind of to trap them down there. And then you add cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, and then you can layer more peppers, onions, um, and you can, and it makes pretty colors. And um, I know you can see me, so, but I'm not sure you can see the jar. I'm going to turn it, although mm -hmm. I took pictures of it, uh, you can see the red from the pepper and the white and the green. Hold and, it up closer to your camera. Uh, where's my camera? There it is. Yeah. Okay, so there's the green Brussels sprouts, then there's cauliflower. And then there's pepper down here. Anyway, it's beautiful and it's colorful. And that's why we added the cauliflower. Um, you can make this recipe in any proportions of cauliflower and Brussels sprouts. You just have to measure them all. This one is a jar, a little, um, it's a, this is a pint, this is a half pint. Uh, it's the same thing. Now you see that pepper? See, I didn't chop it as finely this time. I uh, let it be long strings. I don't like long strings in it, but I thought it would be prettier, and it is. Uh, I like everything cut up so that you don't have to take it out of the jar and then cut it. But you can see this one has a little more cauliflower in it and fewer Brussels sprouts. Okay, this one is all Brussels sprouts. Even though you think you see light in there, it's just a lighter Brussels sprout. And it's, um, it's got chopped up uh, uh, pepper, so it's littler down here. So that's all Brussels sprouts. Cauliflower, yeah. does, the cauliflower does make it prettier. Yes, it does. I, I agree with you. And that's why I changed the recipe. Well, actually, we didn't change the recipe. We changed what we were going to do. Anyway, I didn't mind doing that. Um, I'm fascinated with the whole thing, and I love um, to... Um, uh, to make it different. And uh, I think for this um, presentation, it works really well. Okay, so the other thing I wanted to show you is I have some jars that are hips. They have that ridge around there. And I really like those for the Brussels sprouts because it kind of holds them down into the jar. But I made it with a straight sided one too, and I didn't have any problems. They don't float. So uh, it didn't really matter. But um, I started out with the hips because um, that's just where I started. And there's my funnel. And uh, so I spooned the cauliflower and the Brussels sprouts into the jars. And I spooned the onions and the peppers. And then I poured the solution. And that's why I have a funnel because I don't pour well at all. <laughs> Not at all. So here's my second time around with a little more cauliflower. And then the jar on the far left is, um, is just juice. It's just um, the brine. And I canned it um, because it was a lot that I had left over because I made a smaller batch. I didn't use the 12 cups. I, used, I don't know what I used anymore. Uh, probably six cups, eight cups, but I didn't use 12. And so I had brine left over. And um, I had two and a half jars and I made this recipe twice. So I was not going to put all this in the refrigerator. So I canned the juice. There you go. Um, and, and then I say, you know, I made a full recipe of the pickling solution um, and there you go. And I said that twice already. Okay, so <laughs> when, you're, when you're putting all this stuff in, the other end of this thing, Colleen, is a bubbler. <laughs> and a deep bubbler and uh, it helps get the space out. So you run it down the side of the jar and kind of wiggle it back and forth this way. And uh, it helps to settle them. And you do this after you put the pickling solution in it so that uh, if you need to add something, usually just solution, not, um, not the vegetables because, um, because usually you've got the jar pretty full, then you can measure the head space and it's a uh, half inch. Um, and uh, then you can add more liquid to bring it up to your half inch. Okay, so then you wipe the rims, you put on the lids, uh, and there's more uh, pickling solution. Then you put on the rings. Okay, so I wanna show you, um, 
I'm not giving this jar away. I'm going to take the ring off and I'm going to store it in my cupboard with just the lid on and it is sealed. It is not a problem. It is sealed. And if I got really sloppy and there's any kind of sticky left on the jar, I'm going to put this in under running water and a clean washcloth and I'm going to wipe it off. And then I'm going to wash this part because if it got pickling solution on it, it's going to go bad really fast in the cupboard. So this one I can use again, and this one goes in the cupboard. Now, if you're giving them away, leave the ring on, okay? And if it doesn't come off easily, leave it on. Don't force it off. Uh, but mostly when you're canning this way, the, the rings get really loose. Don't tighten them, J uh, just make sure they're not you know, sloppy loose on there, but don't crank them down because then you're gonna break the seal and whatever it is, it's gonna go bad on the shelf. Okay, I put this into a steam canner uh, and we've all shown you the little hole where the steam comes out. Uh, I put it to the side so that I can see the stream of steam coming out. And usually I have to put a black piece of paper behind it to be able to see it, but I make sure it's there. And uh, then you're ready to process. And I say, cute, sitting all there. And some with blue tops, because that's what I had. And, um, and you process this for 10 minutes. So uh, after you meet all the criteria of the steam canner with the steam coming out and the dial in the green, uh, you process it for 10 minutes, 10 minutes. If something happens and you that process is interrupted and it falls below the green or stops steam coming out, you have to start that timer over again once you get back in the green or back in the, it, with the steam coming out. And uh, with electrical interruptions, if you have an electric stove, just be aware you need to start over again with your processing time. Okay, there it is. You've seen lots of pictures of it. This steam canner is tested and approved by University of California. And this is the one that we teach with the hole and the gauge. Although I like Colleen's gauge picture better, my girl. And there we are, finished products. Let it sit for 24 hours out of any kind of draft. Check to make sure that it's, um, it's sealed, uh, label and date, and either give it away or put it on the, put it on the shelf. And it's shelf stable. Uh, I have found, um, Okay, I hate to admit our errors, but we make them. Uh, <laughs> I, have le I have left canned things with a pickling solution and um, they get mushy. So I do a lot of okra. I like pickled okra, but after a year and a half, it gets mushy. It, it absorbs the liquid and um, has good flavor, but the texture is yuck. But uh, Brussels sprouts a year and uh, two months old are tasty because while I was doing this and found the Brussels sprouts in the cupboard, I opened them and ate them. And <laughs> but I would definitely leave these for at least a couple of weeks to uh, make sure that the flavors mellowed and they just do. And I can't wait to taste them, the um, cauliflower because I've never done cauliflower before. So that'll be uh, a fun thing to taste. And there we go. And I think there's resources at the end. If you want to look up the, um, the, uh, I did get this recipe off the National Center for Home Food Preservation. It directed me to the USDA uh, booklet on um, a pick and the section on pickling. Uh, that is a marvelous publication. It's uh, way too much to download and print, but, or well, you could download it, but printing it, it's got just, it's a book. I mean, it's a loose leaf book, but it's still uh, lots of pages. So just find the one you want and print it out and, and, um, off you go. Good luck. Okay, great. And you are bringing me a jar of those Brussels sprouts, <laughs> right? Yes, I will. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, we have one more section to cover. And it was prepared by uh, another master food preserver who can't be with us this morning, Nancy Siebert. And it's suggestions on how to make your jars pretty. So I'm going to, once again, see if I can manage this. I'm going to share a screen and where's pretty jars? 
Why don't I see pretty jars? I don't see pretty jars. <laughs> this is not good. It was there yesterday. Let me. It sure was. Let me find. Okay, I'm gonna get out of out of stop share. I'm gonna go. Hey, bear with me, folks. I'm gonna go over and find PowerPoint and find out what happened to pretty jars. Escape and file open what happened to pretty jars pretty gifts from the kitchen okay there we go okay now i got it open now i got to go back to zoom okay share screen pretty jars yay <laughs> okay and now we go to slideshow and Nancy Siebert went and did some research and found some pretty jars to share with you to give you ideas on how to how to dress them up if you have that much time I'm not that fancy I um I my my modus operandi is to take a sample of on my shelf there are probably 20 different things that I share and um for me my I have shorthand E means elderberry. <laughs> I, I don't write out elderberry on every jar. I write out E and what month and year I made it. So, but if you're giving it away and you have time and you really want to make it look pretty, here's some ideas for how to do it. And adding labels really helps because not everybody else in the world knows my, uh, my code for all of my things. I do know what it is, but not everybody else does. So when I give them away, I do try to tell people what it is they're choosing. Anyway, you can make labels and there's lots of things to help you make labels that look pretty. You can add fabric to them to make them look pretty, make a bonnet, a ruffle, add some raffia. I don't think I'm gonna go so far as to crochet a sleeve for them, but <laughs> <laughs> just saying. Anyway, you can go off to the craft store and find all of these things. They'll be happy to sell them to you and uh, make some money and you can start working on it and you can make some really fancy labels if you want to um i haven't i haven't taken the time for the learning curve for that yet but as you can see if you go with the fancy label and some lace and stuff you've got some um really pretty looking jars this look like wedding favors that they, they do yeah yes anyway so here's some more simple ones i mean these all that was had added to these jars on the left is just a little bit of raffia. Somebody went, somebody went the extra mile to put a spoon in there. That would be good if you were um, doing the lemon curd. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, it would. And you know, you wouldn't even have to worry about giving away the spoon because I've got some bamboo spoons that I bought for for um, disposable utensils. And ah. so, so you could uh, <laughs> give away the lemon curd with a with a spoon ready ready to go i mean nothing else would be necessary and i don't know about any of you guys but you can well lemon curd the lid would probably come off pretty good but even if it's under pressure i can push off a lid with my thumbs so they wouldn't even have to go home to open the jar okay um this is one for people we didn't cover this today but that is one of the things somebody's made all the ingredients for us for a soup mix and then put it in a jar. And as long as there wasn't anything fresh in there, it'd probably stay good for a long time. If it's all if it's all dried beans, I think you're safe. Dried beans and dried spices, you wouldn't have to worry. Okay, um, different kinds of fabric tops, little pretty labels printed on fancy paper. And you can get those at, at the craft store too, the, the paper that already are printed with many color, colors on. And, that's cute. You've got a snowman and and some, and you know you can buy pieces. You don't have to buy a lot of fabric. The craft stores have um, smaller pieces of that kind of fabric available, and some different kinds of labels. And uh, the little wood ones are kind of cute. You can string them on a piece of raffia and tie it around your uh, your jar, and it looks pretty fancy. And um, these are real easy. You just have to basically cut a circle, cut a circle of fabric, 
Now, okay. somebody who went to the trouble to put the lace on it, that's somebody with more time than me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, you can do it. You could use pinking shears and then it would look pretty cute too. And so just some more ideas. I think Nancy had fun looking at Pinterest and finding um, suggestions <laughs> for, uh, for how to do it. So pretty jars. Okay, I think that, no, we got some more. Decorating your gifts, okay. I don't know what the purpose of a corks is, but anyway, I wanna thank all of you for joining us for today. So adios folks, perfect, perfect day. Thank to you everybody for joining us. Thank you.